Hello and welcome to Money Mind. This week, the economic and geopolitical landscape of the post pandemic world. Who will come out on top? But first, the top five business stories you need to know this week. The U.S. Federal Reserve says it's going to allow inflation to run above target. The new policy means interest rates are likely to remain low. Chinese fintech group Ant is planning to list its shares in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Up to 30 billion U.S. dollars of shares could be on sale. That would make it the world's largest IPO. Chinese electric car maker Xpeng has sold more shares for a higher price than planned, raising about 1.5 billion U.S. dollars in its Wall Street debut. It's the largest initial public offering by a Chinese EV maker in the United States. Singapore's manufacturing output declined 8.4% year-on-year in July. Demand was down in most clusters apart from precision engineering. The U.S. and China have held talks over a phase one trade deal. Washington says both sides see progress, while Beijing called it a constructive dialogue. This week on a virtual edition of the Money Mind Exchange Forum, COVID-19 has reset the world and changed the meaning of the word normal in just about every aspect of life, from the personal to the economic to the geopolitical. Today on Money Mind, we ask, what will this new normal look like on the world stage? Will there be a new post-pandemic balance of power between the world's two largest economies, the United States and China? And what will that changed landscape mean for the rest of us? Today I'm joined by a very special panel of guests. They are Shirley Yu, she is political economist and Asia Fellow at Ash Center, Harvard Kennedy School. Jeffrey Halley, he is Senior Market Analyst for the Asia Pacific at Oanda. And last but not least, Anissa Nataragawa. She's Partner and Managing Director at Asia Group Advisors. Thank you all for joining me here today. It's wonderful to see you. Jeffrey, let's start off with you. So this has been called the Asian Century for global economic growth. That's even before the COVID-19 pandemic. But what are the challenges for China now? Because they still do face some, some concerns in terms of their growth going forward. They most certainly do. When you look at a, 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 in the bigger picture, they also face uh, demographic, uh, demographic challenges, the same as uh, many of the countries that we label as the West. Uh, that will come to the fore. Uh, they, they also have environmental challenges. But I think uh, the main uh, challenge they have now is the readjustment of the great globalization model uh, with regards particularly to the United States at the moment and uh, their, uh, their companies being able to em emerge from this great firewall of China from behind it and uh, fully participate uh, in, in global markets. So, Jeffrey, just following up from that very quickly, what do you make of the growth that we saw, the 3.2% growth in the second quarter? Is it meaningful? Oh, I most certainly is, particularly when you compare it to the rest of the world. Uh, I, I think it shows uh, the ability of China to rebound from COVID-19. It, it's a reflection of uh, the government there being able to marshal resources, and, and it's a reflection of the social discipline of the people of China uh, that they've managed to bring COVID-19 under control uh, with this the sheer mass and size of the Chinese uh, domestic market, and that's helped uh, China to recover, but it too will face challenges uh, in, in, in ahead if uh, export markets start stuttering around the rest of the world. And for that, we really need a COVID-19 uh, vaccine to arrive uh, sooner rather than later. Anissa, bringing you into the conversation here, China's laid the groundwork to dominate the market in protective and medical supplies uh, for years to come, in fact, even beyond this pandemic. But it is an important cog in the global industrial machine. Uh, but countries, other countries do want self-reliance as well. So what has been the impact on China's importance in global supply chains? COVID-19 has really decimated the global economy and the impact that it is having globally is also you know, still emerging. What is clear is the GDP growth around the world will slow down for the remainder of this year and much of next. So the role that China has in this region particularly, as you rightly pointed out, is very much focused on the role in which other countries can um, 
benefit from changes in the global supply chain. Uh, as countries start to rebuild and recover the economies, the role of foreign direct investment and global trade will be integral. Um, at the current time, I would say that China's economic role in the region has, has not been, we haven't seen a negative you know, um, reaction from, from COVID, and there is no signs that it is slowing down at this time. Um, and you know, as the Chinese economy was one of the first to restart this year, we do foresee that as other countries start to restart, China will continue to play a role in that regard as well. All right, so let's talk about that issue of how quickly economies can rebound and what they're based on because surely you know the foundations of the development and the establishment of regional economies was that post-war liberal order so what are the US's current uh, set of objectives on trade and defense uh, insofar as China is concerned and and have they evolved to a point that we would like to see them over the past couple of months, we have heard a series of speeches from very senior officials. Then I think they have really comprehensively redefined the current U.S.-China relationship. And as a result of that, I quote uh, Attorney General Barr's words, the most important issue in the 21st century for the United States, that is the response to the rising global ambitions of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And so um, this whole uh, redefinition of the grand strategy between China and the U.S., I think, uh, is two-pronged. The first prong is economic. Uh, the U.S., uh, as uh, Attorney General Barr laid out, clearly the U.S. is not going to allow China to take over the United States at the commanding heights of the global economy. And so it is, uh, uh, that is economic. And then the second prong is uh, uh, ideological. And so again, uh, using uh, Secretary Pompeo's words, it is that as China economically ascend, uh, China also seeks to uh, design a global hegemony uh, with itself as the center. And so essentially now, as we see clearly in the current decade and perhaps uh, going into the next couple of decades down until this uh, economic uh, competition between the world's two largest power essentially pans out, uh, we are going to have this uh, very anarchic and very competitive situation where essentially the competition is only going to be centered both on ideology and on the economy. So while these U.S.-China tensions sort of boil over. Other countries, particularly in this region, they're looking by nervously. Jeffrey, you know, who continues to benefit from these objectives then of the, of the U.S. approach to China? Well, it's actually hard to see a, a clear winner uh, from uh, this ongoing conflict, as I would describe it, between uh, China and the United States. The countries within ASEAN are caught squarely in the middle here of having to negotiate a very eye of the needle, as, as, as I'd like to describe it, uh, politically between uh, it, the United States as a key export market and also China as a key export market. Uh, they don't really want to hang their flag on uh, either, either side, uh, and that will make it very challenging because uh, Asia's fortunes are intrinsically tied to China on one side, particularly with the export of uh, primary products, but also with their export-driven economic models across the region. They're also intrinsically tied to the fate of the United States as well. We're going to go for a quick break right now, but when we come back, my panel and I will be discussing what's at stake with the tech war. Welcome back to this edition of a virtual Money Mind Exchange panel where we're talking about the shifting balance of powers in terms of the economy. Let's get back to Shirley. You know, Shirley, the current front with the current tech cold war between the United States and China, put into context for us, who are the winners and losers of, of such a war? Yeah, I think uh, we should welcome competition. As long as it is healthy competition, I, I think it, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be beneficial to the rest of the world as, uh, as a whole. And I think, you know, to have uh, China, uh, as we all know, has uh, pumped a huge amount of dollars starting from uh, um, the Made in China 2025 to AI Vision 2030 to the most recent China Standards 2035. And I think uh, 
recently, even uh, the U.S. has been talking about we have to be able to compete with a whole of government approach. So why not have a whole of government approach? Let's uh, have the U.S. You know, we do not really see cutting edge technology coming onto the U.S. horizon at this very moment that will give the U.S. that significant economic takeoff, like what it has always done for the past uh, uh, century or so. And so we really um, would welcome that possibility for the U.S. to uh, have another major uh, technological breakthrough that will give the world another major economic takeoff. And particularly in regards to this on, ongoing uh, sort of tech, su superpower tech marathon, uh, if, if you like, there is bipartisan consensus uh, as far as, as their position is concerned. So will the outcome of the November elections have any impact on, on U the U.S. stance towards China? I think that really depends on who, who wins. Um, there's an existential crisis, I think, in Western capitalism at the moment. Uh, it's uh, not uh, brought everybody up equally. And the reason that we're seeing these populist policies uh, coming in around the world, most particularly in the, in the United States, which has led to this China position at the moment that we see with this present administration, is those who have and those who have not. And increasingly, a larger proportion of the population is being left behind uh, in this new technology digital age. And what they need to do is address the underlying causes there in order to have a sensible conversation with the rest of the world. Anissa, put into perspective for us then the position of other countries. Are we beginning to see the beginning of a digital divide here? Digital divide or digital fragmentation, perhaps, but the landscape for uh, the, the digital uh, Asia Pacific, particularly, is really going to shape the, the political and economic landscape over the next few years. It's interesting because many countries in this region, uh, one issue where they agree on is really the role of digitalization and technology as uh, to underpin economic growth. So that's a priority that we've seen many countries focus on over the last few years with um, increasing adoption of you know, digital economy and industry 4.0 uh, goals in Southeast Asia particularly, and one that we see will increase particularly due to the um, increase in spike in online activity and, and the importance of ICT during the COVID pandemic. I want to go back to the point that Shirley was making about the fact that more competition is, is good. Uh, by all accounts, that tech Cold War, it, it is already here. Uh, but, you know, it's arguably, arguably we should push back against unfair practices in uh, intellectual property rights. So how far does that stance between the United States and China now threaten to impoverish the, the very nature, the very culture of what AI sharing and technology innovation is all about? I think that China is going sort of towards that direction because if you imagine uh, as China continues to uh, build into AI Vision 2030 and China Standards 2035, so we are talking about seeing this ambition to lead uh, the global standards of technologies in the IoTs, in AIs, in smart cities, uh, possibly in telecom and the uh, sovereign digital currency. And so uh, all of these areas, if China were to uh, indeed, to get ahead, China uh, has an intrinsic need uh, for intellectual protection. And so back to the U.S.-China phase one trade deal, so there were some sort of improvements, but uh, just as it goes currently, uh, the phase one trade deal is primarily a commercial deal. Currently, um, we do not see much breakthrough in that area, and so we do not really see much more substantive discussions. To Shirley's point, there is a, a future in where you know everybody or, or most people would emerge from this as a beneficiary of of this race, this technological race. Um, it is in nobody's favorite thing to be forced into a situation where uh, you know one must pick one 
form of technology or one form of standards over the other. Uh, I think Singapore itself has been very careful and very clever to also position itself as, as a country where technology from any country can come and to position itself as, as an open market in that regard, uh, whereby investors would also be able to access uh, all types of technology. So as companies reassess where they are putting their supply chains globally, this is also a factor that will come into play. Um, so again, and having several options will, will be key in terms of securing supply chain investment in the future. And insofar as this tech war is concerned, do you believe that China and the United States, in terms of their stance, they do want to emerge as dominant? Look at the United States. I think a lot of it is driven by fear and populism. And uh, if we were to have a change of administration, for example, uh, some of those fears and some of that anger may be alleviated. I don't believe that China is looking to dominate the world. I don't think that's in their psyche. I think they want to just trade with everybody. So uh, I think there's a lot of fear about China because of the way that China reacts uh, when things are said about China that it doesn't agree with. So until I think China needs to learn to uh, become a much more benign force on the international stage, rather than one that perhaps makes people scared. All right. Plenty more still ahead, so stay with us. Welcome back to this special virtual edition of the Money Mind Exchange. We're talking about the shifting balance of power between the United States and China. And Lisa, let's start off with you in this segment. What does this shift in the balance of power mean for countries in ASEAN? How are countries and, and the private sector responding to what we're seeing? I think there's um, actually significant potential for countries in ASEAN um, as we emerge and recover from this pandemic. There's a lot of focus on certain core issues, uh, digitalization, SME development, as well as attracting uh, increased FDI. It's quite encouraging to see the number of uh, incentives that have been introduced by countries such as Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam. Speaking to, to some of these investment agencies in these countries is the uh, kind of openness that they have demonstrated as well as the interest in what other countries in the region are doing. So there's been a lot of requests for um, kind of best practices, for sharing of the incentives that other countries are adopting, uh, particularly within ASEAN itself. President Xi Jinping has put into focus uh, the fact that they want to continue to build on China's domestic market, as an example. But how committed does the country still remain uh, in, in a post-COVID-19 world, when we eventually get there, to opening up to, to globalization. It'll be a different kind of globalization, Don. So first of all, as you see recently, uh, there has been a call, and you were quite correct about it, about driving domestic consumption, but at the same time to bring our global supply chain closer to home, especially at the very top of top very top end of the global supply chain. And also with the recent uh, TikTok and WeChat ban, it does then the ambitions of this generation of the best Chinese technology companies from going global. But at the middle to lower end of the global supply chain from China, it's going to continue to integrate closer with ASEAN nations. On the demand side, I should also say China has had a recent push to turn China into uh, from the world's factory to the world's market. 70% of the foreign companies' and productions in China are actually sold within China. That is a high number. And so this new generation of globalization is going to be for the global companies to come into China and start to produce and consume within China. What are the new investment opportunities that are arising out this potential shift uh, in this balance of power post-COVID-19? Big tech, uh, it's worked successfully in the US. I, I am absolutely sure that large tech in China will follow uh, the same path of market dominance, but AI, robotics, I think, will become extremely significant uh, in, the next, uh, in the next decade. But I, I believe that the main uh, issue behind all of this is that all of these companies or all of this development uh, results in 
uh, lessening of inequality. Inequality, economic inequality, I think is the real issue that confronts uh, Asia and the rest of the world uh, with regards to new technologies. Yes, I think that we actually perhaps need a new definition of globalization. Um, there's been so many changes to the economy, to even the way that people are working. There will be changes in how people are traveling, uh, the workforce. You know, that is one factor we haven't really touched on here. But you know, the extent to which companies will be, um, you know, relocating and and bringing about diaspora. Um, that's all going to be changing for the next few years, and to an extent that we can't really foresee yet at this at this time. So I think the traditional definition of global globalization that um, you know, we have, have founded on, on physical travel, on the physical flow of goods, will uh, need to be redefined. Ultimately, what do you think is going to determine the post-pandemic balance of power? Well, my, my immediate answer would be uh, whoever's first to the line on the vaccine <laughs> will, be, will be a key factor for, for sure. Uh, I think, you know, many governments right now in terms of their priorities and their policy making, I see that it's very immediate focus. It's next three months, next six six months. And um, so the, to the extent that, uh, again, it's, it's pandemic management, uh, health and safety of, of citizens, and of course, economic stability and recovery. So to the extent that countries can work together on those issues in a way that is mutually beneficial will be the main determinant for the balance of powers in the next few months. I don't think that the world has ever been smarter, richer, had more knowledge and more ability to deploy it. And if the world, and particularly the US and China, fail to learn the lessons of history, then they'll have let themselves and the rest of the world down. Uh, I do believe that healthy competition, as uh, Shirley alluded to earlier, is the key, and that at the end of the day, these two countries with their uh, different systems of doing things in the world need to learn to live and work with each other in a sensible and mutually respectful way, and then the world can move forward. This year, China is projected to grow at 2%. U.S., uh, according to IMF, is uh, projected to contract about 6%. And so China will grow on relative basis another 8% against the uh, U.S. GDP. And so as uh, Attorney General Barr said, China is a near-peer competitor. And I think if China continues to relatively ascend against the United States economy, then uh, it'll come closer from a near-peer competitor to a peer competitor. And so what that means to the world, essentially, it is fundamentally economics talking. And so um, over the coming decades, we are just moving into a very anarchic period of time where essentially we're going to have not only two powers, I think multiple powers are trying to work out uh, what is the best for them. And then until uh, one power definitively rise, we don't know which one, uh, you know, it's all possible on the table. Well, we've come to the end of this special edition, this virtual edition of the Money Mind Exchange panel on the shifting balance of power on the economies around the world and the implications on us all. It remains for me to thank my guests today. They are Shirley Yu, political economist and Asia Fellow at Ash Center, Harvard Kennedy School, Jeffrey Halley, senior market analyst for Asia Pacific at Oanda, and Anissa Nataligawa, partner and managing director at Asia Group advisors. Thank you all.